It's recording, ready to go. Okay. Yes, it would. Yes, you could find it. So basically, we, we can get it. Yeah. Okay. Well, well, welcome to BCS London. I'm glad to see such a good turnout. My name is John Tavelli, I'm chair of FACTS. I know quite a lot of you. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Jonathan. Do come and have a chat afterwards. Uh, just housekeeping for those of you who don't know, um, you may notice that I'm uh, wearing my special European Union tie. This is from the genuine uh, 1990s when uh, we had lots of very nice projects going on uh, in the European Union. Uh, but anyway, yes, just to let you know housekeeping, we have two ways to Brexit from here. <laughs> there's a soft Brexit this way, and there's a the hard Brexit that way, and so if the fire alarm goes off, it is a fire alarm. Don't wait for the government to tell you to Brexit. <laughs> uh, so anyway, th this is quite a celebratory event, because uh, Fax is 40 years old. Uh, no, we think it's 40, maybe 41. It seems to be lost in this time. Anyway, we're celebrating 40. Uh, we're hoping to actually do some archiving of uh, all our early newsletters and so on, so they may be online at some point. But also, the, the fact journal, formal aspects of the Peterson Journal, is 30. And if you go outside, there's a few copies of the latest issue and some leaflets, so do have a look at those, pick up the leaflets if you like. And of course, the main event here, we're talking about UTP, Unifying Theories of Programming, uh, which is 20. So we can look forward to UTP 40 and 20 years of time. Uh, and we do have the, the two people who really uh, made UTP happen. Uh, and uh, well, I was a doctor at the time, I was on, involved with the Procross project, proving the great systems. Uh, we had a, lots of European involvement, also a lot of Chinese involvement. The two of the most important people on that project were Han Jie Feng, who was going to give the talk, and then Zhou Chao Chen, who came from China. And, and of course, Tony Dorf, who I doesn't need a great long introduction for me. But anyone who wants an introduction, come and see me afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> I think hopefully you all know, know who Tony is. Uh, so I have a sort of memory of uh, Tony and Jiffen working on early UCP, and sort of, I guess in the early 90s, uh, which was when I was at Oxford. Uh, and and my, Tony will correct me in a moment, I get this wrong, but so I seem to remember Tony would come up with a brilliant idea to UCP, and he'd tell Jiffen, and Jiffen would go away and do the mathematics. And they come back and I would tell Tony, yes, that's great, the mathematics all works, or no, it's, there's, a, there's something wrong with us. And this would go around a little loop. So about uh, two or three times, Tony would come back and say, oh, try this. And you think, might say yes, or he might say no. Um, and that, so it reminded me of that uh, saying by Lewis Carroll, what I say three times is true. It seems to me in this logic that what Tony said three times was uh, false. <laughs> so if you tried it three times and Jeff Beck said no, then we had to move on to something else. Anyway, I'll pass you over to Tony, who will tell you what, what really happened. Tony. Thank you very much. Yes, it's all true. Yeah. It all happened in just that way. I remember that Jeff uh, Beck once, uh, I've used a bit more uh, amplification. Yes, I think that's a very young trick back at the time. Does this one work better? No. I can give you this one. Right. As well. So. Oh, oh, off mode. Probably. Did you switch it on? Yeah. If I switch the mute button. Oh, yeah, yeah. 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 Um, our draft chapter, chapter 8, um, it comes to 20 pages, which was our ration for each chapter. And he said, I have, I have input all 200 of them, because there were nine previous versions, which were also input. So she said, I'm very sorry for the way I have treated you. Well, uh, that brings me to the uh, main topic of my brief introduction. Um, in which I would like to introduce the first steps 
in the UTP project, uh, the research project which led to the publication of the book on the entire theories of programming. I'll give you a personal account, um, which will be followed by Jerome's personal account of the project itself and its subsequent, subsequent exploitation of its results in education and industry. He left uh, Oxford in 1998, so I regret, to join Zhou Chai Chen and Macau um, at the United Nations University um, uh, to take over teaching and took a teaching role in their software engineering initiative. In 2002, he, was, um, uh, he left the um, Macau Institute and um, was the founding director of the Software Engineering Institute in Shanghai of um, the East China Normal University. Our final presentation will be uh, by another actor in the field, Jim Woodcock, who is now established as this country's leading researcher in UTP and its applications in industry. Um, I hope we will learn from the personal experiences of both of them. I date the project back explicitly to the year 1986-87, when I took my first sabbatical year from Oxford University. I chose to spend the year with my friends Ezra Dijkstra and Jay Misra at the University of Texas in Austin. I had spent the previous nine years since I was appointed as Professor of Computation in Oxford's um, Program Research Group um, in 1977. During those nine years, I had recruited a strong research team in the theory of programming. It started with Fajori Mondavriar, who developed the Z specification language um, and was uh, um, uh, ably reinforced by Cliff Jones, an originator of the Vienna development method for the design of programming models. Um, he, it was he um, who independently of me, <coughs> under, under my supervision, invented and developed the rely guarantee method of specifying and verifying the use of shared memory by concurrent threads in a program at a time when it was no, not yet uh, uh, popular uh, to talk about shared memory at all. This paradigm is now accepted in scientific and industrial circles as the standard solution for the race uh, conditions which plague the introduction of concurrency into programming practice. In 1986, uh, my directly employed research colleagues included Ian Hayes, Giffon, Carol Morgan, Bill Roscoe, Jeff Sanders, Eve Sorensen, Mike Spivey, and Bernard Suffering. All ten of us were independent researchers in the same field of high caliber, and each of us we were capable of developing independent specification language and an independent theory of programming for ten of us. And the prospect of disputatious competition between us was what frightened me at that time. And so I resolved at the beginning of my sabbatical year that I would solve the problem of um, uh, bringing my whole team to work together on um, the ideals uh, which inspired us. My solution was to exploit the power of algebra to unify theories. As my inspiration and guide, I took the formulation of the properties of radically, the algebraic formulation of the properties of radically different models of um, uh, number uh, starting, of course, with natural numbers and integers, fractions, and numbers, and then by ab abandoning uh, the axioms of total ordering, it's possible to extend the same algebra 
to complex numbers, quaternions, matrices, and beyond. So I resolved for this example by codifying um, the algebraic laws applicable to the constants and the composition operators of programs and their specification. After all, who could deny that sequential composition was an associative operation? The article entitled Laws of Programming, um, <coughs> which I wrote in the early part of my sabbatical year, appeared in 1987 in the communications of ACM. Its authors included all my collaborators, current collaborators in the world. In this way, I cunningly obtained all their signatures, <laughs> attesting to their agreement with the algebraic law. <laughs> there wasn't a single dissenting voice or a single resignation, which somehow, somehow I think, trumped um, the Prime Minister's... Yeah. <laughs> 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 in which you had a similar plot yeah. <laughs> agreement for, for Brexit. Yeah. In 1987, the University of Texas, in the person of Ham Richards, set up a year of programming. It consisted of a series of week-long seminars conducted by leading researchers in the field, for example, David Turner in function pro functional programming and Mike Gordon in computer-assisted verification. And for one of the seminars, I've forgotten which one it was, we invited Henry Fung uh, to join us. And while he was in Austin, he and I discussed the goal of unifying theories of programming and resolved to make this the focus of our subsequent joint research. The research, as you know, culminated eventually in the publication of the book that we celebrate today. Um, I have a figure here that the scientific impact of this book is assessed by Google Scholar as just under 1,500 um, citations, which for a book I think is very good going. Neither of us dreamt that we would spend more than 10 years on the project, and I leave this and subsequent developments to be described by those who are still engaged in the project over 40 years later. First, 25, and secondly, the facts. I'm sure they will enjoy what they have to tell us. Thank you. Very glad to be here. And Tony Han introduced the history of UTP and 20 years ago when I left Oxford for Macau. I had a discussion with Tony about the training of UTP. Tony's slogan at that time is a top-down approach and a bottom approach meeting the middle. My understanding is that the middle point is the icon. 
we had a very early paper on loss of proving. Well, I had not tried to see auto contract model and the operational semantics dialected from algebra. So in the last couple of years, I tried that approach. The seems work for a couple of examples. And I have a feature test scan to use the same approach to handle a quantum problem. And this talk you tell you how to use algebra to uh, attack non-determinic probability problem. Actually, this topic is an older topic. Two years ago, we had a couple of papers. And uh, we used quite a traditional model and identify each program as a mapping from the initial state to the final distribution over the states. <coughs> and I did not find any error at that time. A couple of years later, when I tried to do some calculation with the algebra, I realized that something goes wrong with the selection of state space. So this talk is just tell you um, how I correct mistake I made in the early papers. And also show you that it is nice to start with algebra. We can tell you how to design a collector state space for your denotational semantics. The second contribution of this our talk is we like to have a close tie between uh, algebra with operational semantics. The usual people take operation approach and uh, introduce a lot of transition rules. But they never tell us why this section in our rules is consistent with the denotational model. Also, there's no way to check if we have missed some rules or we have added too much rules. <coughs> we raised this issue in the UTP book, but we did not find a, a prop solution for that link. And my talk will show you how to link uh, algebra with the uh, operational approach as well. So, so I take three steps. First is contract an algebraic semantics, which consists of three parts. The first is a set of laws. And then I show you how to introduce refinement relation in this algebra. You still need to take some order, arguing that one program is better than another one. And finally, we have to show that the set of laws is good enough, enabling to transform program into normal form. This is necessary in many mathematical theory. You must show that you can provide a canonical form for your program. This is the first part of our approach. The second part is, I like to demonstrate how to construct the denotational semantics from the algebra. So this means you are able to find a good uh, state space. In the UTP book, probably suggests that every program should be identified as a set of observation one can make during its execution. Then the problem is how to select the proper type for so-called observations. For simple language, we regard the program as a relation between import and output. And in many cases, import and output <coughs> are the same type. But this is not the case in <coughs> many uh, new computing paradigms. So you must be very careful to select a proper type for so-called output. And in the conventional program language, we have very nice theory to deal with non-termination and bounded non-determinism. But those results cannot be used directly to some new language. The non-termination is permitted in many experiments. They like happy to see all sorts of finite approximations with a time bound. They never ask you will program terminate or not. 
So this is why we like to have algebra some part. The final one is, I like to show you it's principle possible to give a specification for so-called consistent operational semantics. <coughs> because operational semantics is a set of rules. However, you must give a rule, give a specification for those rules in advance. Otherwise, there's no simple way to check if the set of rules you put forward is consistent with respect to the algebra or to the denotation of semantics. And I hope this approach plus top-down approach and bottom approach, we have a lot of choice to link different sort of program series. <coughs> And next few slides, I tell you how to go from uh, algebra down to denotation model. With the given program algebra, in principle, we are able to give a uh, property for so-called testing of it. But testing is an important uh, step in the development process. But then in any way, you must give a formal definition for so-called test. <coughs> so I define a test uh, is operated with two arguments. The first argument, S, stands for the uh, testing data or initial state. The second argument of this test object is the program text P. And we put them in sequence. And uh, its execution will give you all possible observation for this particular test. Once we have this kind of operator, <coughs> we are able to identify a program as a binary relation between any state S with observation when makes during its execution. Here I cannot assign type for observation at this stage. But later I will show you this selection is a hard job. And if you accept this sort of model for programs, then it's straightforward to define a refinement ordering in a denotation model. The main task is to show that the refinement ordering denotation model is the same as you put down in the algebra. So they are conscious of each other. And then you are going to give a formal algebra definition for operational model in the final stage. So you have three steps, algebra, denotation model, and uh, operational system. I select a uh, quite a well-known language. It's a mild extension of guarded command language with a new operator called the probability choice. On the final term uh, of the first line, you see this O plus operator, which has a list of alternatives. Each alternative P is associated with the probability it can be selected by the program. So actually, you provide a, a set of choice to uh, computer self and let it to decide which branch is set, which, which probability. And other operator almost have the same meaning as we have studied from the data commands language. Here I have a simple example show that once you have accept this operator, you have to think about how to specify so-called non-termination. P is a simple program. Every time it make a choice, you can either terminate immediately or going back to the initial state. <coughs> so it will continue if you many times. You never expect execution of program P can terminate in finite amount of time. Because continue to make a choice. However, we have to be able to Distinguish program P from the chaotic program 
bottom, also from skin. And this is the job for the artifact. You must be very careful selecting a form of technique for non-termination. The same example is sorry, unbounded non <coughs> This is not permitted in the conventional programming language. But here I have a simple example showing that it's quite easy to write down a program which can produce infinite number of outputs. Program P starts with a simple assignment which assigns value 1 to x and follows up with a recursive defined program the body of this recursive make a uh, non uh, make probability choice between skip and then increase the value x by one, then going back. So if we draw a transition tree, you can see the first branch produce value x equal to one. <coughs> However, if you go further step, the second branch will take two as the final value of x. If you go forward n steps, you will have n as the value of program variable x. So in the end, the execution of p will produce natural number one by one. And this makes the one question is, which type of finite observation we can adopt to specify the behavior of p? I think this is another challenge. We cannot answer straightforwardly in the denotational model. Because we always talk about finitely property of programs. But that's not true in this simple language. So I, this is just summary. Challenge is how to specify behavior of non-termination program from its finite approximations. So this means we would like to have a sequence of final program whose behavior in the future <coughs> very close to what we expect from the program set. Just like you take rational number and you contract a sequence of rational number, then I argue that the limit of this sequence is a real number. The second is we have to define properly a refined relation among finite and infinite observations. We cannot say infinite observation is a refinement of finite observation. It's not so straightforward. So these two challenges are left for the designer of algebra. I should get in. This simple language, a probability choice, uh, plays a very special role. Uh, it has a very different rules from uh, architectural point of view and also from the data space point of view. First, it can be able to construct a final approximation for a non termination program. So it acts as a program. The second role it can play is to define. Uh, uh, elegant representation for our probability data space. So it can be act as a program, also can act as a data. So we put the data <coughs> a program into the same category and make our job a little bit easier. So I just like to present some idea laws for this. Uh, probability choice. Actually, the set of laws is divided into classes. The first class tells you the relation between this choice operator with other programming operator. So first of all, tell you if we have non different choice inside of alternatives, in principle, it is distributed over probability choice. The second law tells you that you are able to eliminate nested probability choice. 
So you know, I have a flat structure. It's just a single choice. The third law tell you how to compose sequential composition. Uh, uh, how to compose sequential component with each alternative in your probability choice. So in that case, the probability choice becomes the outermost operator. The final one says, if you carry on some state change, you can postpone that change and take the choice of it first. That's all. We only have four new laws to link probability choice operator with others. The second class is very straightforward. <coughs> how to clean up some representation for uh, our alternatives. For example, you may say all the alternatives can be uh, permitted. You don't mind which one put in the first, which one put in the end. And then the law says that you can remove uh, those alternatives with zero probability because they will never be executed. The third one says if we have two alternatives, in principle you can combine their weight function together to reduce the number of alternatives. And the fourth law says you cannot guarantee all the probability value you put inside its choice has some one. So we have to explore some unknown factor. So here the law says that you add all the beta i together, then calculate which probability is left for unknown output. So the bottom program in this case very similar for unknown output. You don't know what the where it happened. And the final one says you can uh, remove this operator because you know Q will be selected every time. So that's all. We have two pages algebra law for probability choice. And if you are familiar with God common language, nothing will be new in the next few slides. Everything is uh, very straightforward. So here we have talked about the law of non-determined choice. And we hope algebra will tell us probability choice is a correct implementation of non-determined choice. Because probability choice gives you more information about which branch will be executed, which, which probability. And now this choice says nothing about this choice weight function. And the second paragraph says that like in the convention program language, the non-determinist operator in this language is also idempotent, symmetric, associative. It has a bottom as zero. So this is a concertable extension. I did not create any new law for uh, to surround this mutual operator. However, we have to be very careful for the uh, disjunctive law for sequence composition. That question was raised by Tony 20 years ago. Sequence composition is still left disjunctive for this first lawsuit. If you have this young uh, not in choice as the, the first argument of the sequence of composition is safe to move the second component into this choice. <coughs> However, if you have non different choice of the second argument of sequence of composition, you must be very careful. Because demon always do its best to make your mistake. So in this case, if you have a state change assignment at the very beginning, this did not give non-team choice any opportunity to make a thing worse, because there's only one single output. So in that case, you still be able to combine 
assignment with individual component of non-credentials. That's all. You don't have a general right to change the law. And once we have these laws, we can prove this uh, simple result. If we have non choice choice between P and Q, there will be no change if we have another quality choice based on P and Q. <coughs> so this means non given choice really helps to hide all possible probability choice. I will not get any proof one by one. You can read, I would say. In this language, conditional choice can be uh, regarded as a redundant one because it can be represented by probability choice. So you can forget about this operator. You are the late stage. You only have two choices. Either non determinative or probability choice. <coughs> and as Tony said, the you know, advanced sequence composition is a very nice object. <coughs> it's associative. It has unknown as a, a left and a right zero, and skip as a left and right unit. I don't think anyone will challenge these three well known laws for sequence composition. And now we have to talk about what is so-called atomic action in this language. Of course, there are different sort of atomicity defined in different language. But in this language, we treat a state update as an atomic action. This means you cannot split a silent state as two steps. The first step is to evaluate the right-hand side expression. The second step is to assign that value 